Hi folks and welcome to Walking on the Ween Side. Today, taking a stroll with me is my friend and social activist, Keith McHenry from the group Food Not Bombs. And Keith, welcome and thank you for walking down the avenue with us. Thanks for having me. That's fantastic. It's so cool. So what is Food Not Bombs about, beside the obvious? <laughs> Well, Food Not Bombs uh, is about actually recovering um, mostly organic produce and, and uh, whole foods and making vegan meals that we share on the streets. And uh, today we do it in over a thousand cities in over 65 countries. And we also participate in providing meals to uh, protests. You know, we were very involved in helping uh, divert food and cook food at the occupations, you know, Occupy Wall Street. We had, like, a lot of volunteers involved in that kitchen. And uh, I participated in, in not only Occupy Wall Street itself in uh, Zuccotti Park, but also in many, many other occupations, uh, Freedom Plaza, so on down in uh, Washington, D.C. And Food Not Bombs activists, even in um, Budapest and Moscow, provided food during the during Occupy. So that's one of the other things we do. Our main idea, though, is um, when we started in 1980 in Boston, our concern was that a lot of activist groups didn't talk to the mainstream community. So we wanted to do kind of a combination of street theater with literature and direct communication to the public walking by. And so that's at the real core of Food Not Bombs, is that we are trying to be the town square that, you know, once existed and where the people would come by and by accident run into us and like if whatever the political situation was occurring in their community, and now that could be anything because we're worldwide, that the dialogue would inspire people to take action in some kind of way, um, hopefully positive action, and that... Um, we're introducing people to being to the importance of being vegan because of climate change and and uh, you know the suffering of animals and health effects and an anti-capitalist message is often part of what we're trying to do and obviously the connection between um, militarism and the um, state repression and the increased poverty since our resources go so much to the military instead of to education, health care, and other social services. So it would be fair to say that your agenda is a fairly progressive agenda. Yes, yeah, I would say we were pretty, we were progressive, we were radical. We have three uh, principles which were agreed upon at our um, at a world gathering that we had in San Francisco, both at one in 1992 and one uh, when we were providing uh, food. We also provide food for the protest against uh, the 500th anniversary of Columbus coming to the New World. Um, and at that, the three was our original three principles, which we then ratified again in 1995 at a much larger gathering in San Francisco, was uh, that the that. The food is always uh, free to anyone, rich or poor, drunk or sober, um, and it's always vegan or vegetarian, and no one's turned away, no matter what. The second one is that we have no leaders or presidents or headquarters or directors, and that each chapter is autonomous and uses a consensus process and involves the actual people needing the food in helping make the decisions to guide the local um, chapter. And the third is we're not a charity, but we're dedicated to nonviolent direct action to change society. So no one has to go to war, die in war. No one has to stand in line to eat at a soup kitchen. No one has to live in the streets. No one has to go be, you know, remain illiterate. And so we um, participate in a huge number under that guideline. Young people, like um, I estimated around 10,000 volunteers worldwide, mm. go out and they do like regular meals in town squares or in front of post office, federal buildings, things like that, parks. Or they also do in, uh, this, um, actions where they provide meals at many, many protests. And the very first one, uh, one of the earliest ones we did was actually a uh, soup line 
outside of the Federal Reserve Bank in South Station in Boston, claiming that the policies of the Bank of Boston and the policies of Ronald Reagan could lead to a future where people might have to stand in line and eat at a soup kitchen. And in 19, on March 26, 1981, there really wasn't that many homeless people. And that's, and that's when uh, uh, homeless uh, people suggested, the few that did show up that we met at the Pine Street Inn in the South End, said there's no meals for homeless people in, in Boston. If you did this every day, it would be great. And so at that point, we just quit our jobs and we set up a distribution network where we took food to housing projects. And we also provided free meals and street theater at Harvard Square, uh, Park Street Station, Copley Square, Boston Commons. And from that little group of eight of us, eventually we transformed into this worldwide movement. Uh, now you mentioned uh, social action kinds of things, and I, one of my the ones that right now are very dear to my heart is the uh, Dakota oil pipeline. And I was wondering if uh, Food Not Bombs has had any presence in that. Well, yes, we have. We arrived originally on November first and started uh, a vegan kitchen there, and we're still there to this day. And uh, it's re really intense trying to deal with the snow and so on. So, for instance, uh, we were donated a large tent, a military tent. Mm -hmm. And um, we set up a kitchen in there until it became so impossible with the wood stoves that we had in there to keep it warm. So then we have these little uh, what we call tarpies. And people, we would cook in these little uh, tarpies with wood stoves and, and more contained. Um, but we're there right now, and we have a, a number of campaigns that have, have happened as at Standing Rock itself. And I myself went there, um, and uh, it was really a remarkable ex experience. And um, part of what we're doing now is making sure that when the floods come in the spring, that debris doesn't fill into the river, and so that we're trying to uh, get uh, panel trucks and so on to take away some of the clothing and, and really valuable supplies that could be lost and give them to uh, uh, Native people across North America. So there's that campaign, and then we were also on the front lines of, um, you know, going to, um, we did like a silent march, um, that was uh, maybe a couple thousand people that I participated in. And um, so we've been super, super active. And Food Not Bombs volunteers from all over the country have been showing up and helping at the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So we have very close ties to um, the uh, Taos Pueblo in Taos, New Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. We have a Food Not Bombs free school that actually sh uh, shares a border with the Taos Pueblos, uh, one of their pastors. And we've been working with those activists. And, and actually, Food Not Bombs has had an indigenous uh, connection from the very beginning where we actually provided food to the Mohawk Nation when they were protesting um, uh, attacks by the New York State Police in the Adirondacks. And we've, connect, we've done big mountain support um, against Peabody Coal and, and, and uh, all the ravages there. And we've been really connected also to Aboriginal people in Australia. Um, I participated in a tent embassy that was organized by local Aboriginal uh, elders and Maori people. So we've had like this kind of a long, long history of being connected with Native American communities and indigenous people all over the world to resist the repression that is happening. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but I have the feeling in the coming years with the current administration in Washington that there may be an ever-increasing need for this kind of social slash political action. What do you think? I th Already I am seeing, um, well, even in the, you know, since the 2008 uh, economic crisis, uh, um, you know, we've seen huge numbers of homeless people, and the numbers. Uh, the Washington Post reported uh, several times in the last 12 months that they that studies show that there's a uh, uh, two million five hundred thousand homeless uh, people under the age of 18 walking the streets of the United States, mm -hmm. internally displaced people. So you already have that uh, underlying chaos, and then so many people who are facing you know, dire situations because of the economic policies. And you could just see in the last couple of days of uh, 
the executive orders and the cabinet members that have been chosen and confirmed and so on, that we're going to, uh, you know, Reagan will seem like a pussycat. We'll look back like we do now with Richard Nixon being fantastic, the founder of the Clean Air Act and the, the president presided over the EPA and so on. Um, that will, you know, you know, the the disgust at people like Ronald Reagan will seem mild by comparison to what is going on now. So I would say, um, with like the executive orders to do the uh, Keystone Pipeline and um, the Dakota Access Pipeline, the deportation uh, um, uh, ideas that he's presenting, the wall is like executive orders on the wall, executive orders on attacking the immigrants uh, from uh, Muslim countries and so on. It's already going full tilt into total uh, ec- what well, could be economic and social chaos. And we, have, I, it seemed like ever, even since the inauguration, I had, I think I've only skipped one day of not beating something in some major way <laughs> during that whole time. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's almost a, a perpetual protest. And I'm noticing on uh, news feeds and so on that Food Not Bombs is participating in actions in, in, all over the world in response to the chaos that were, um, you know, that Trump promises the world. So, I mean, we've had actions uh, in not, you know, with the women's action, we provided food for uh, many of those protests on the day after the inauguration. We were, um, WAGO reports that we did 1,500 meals uh, in Washington, D.C. during the inauguration protests. So we're, I, I would say that we are looking at probably the busiest four years possible um and uh and then the amount of response you know so many new so many people the women's march or the inauguration march or the marches right after the election were the first protests that many many people ever participated in (laughs) and so um you know a lot of it is great going out saying you're against stuff but then to provide alternatives and food not bombs not only is, provi- is providing food for the uh, protests and just keeping people alive. But we also have all these other uh, projects that we do. For instance, Food Not Lawns, where we take over abandoned lots and teach people how to do organic gardening. Or we have a squatters movement that we uh, helped found called Homeside Jails, where we take over uh, bank foreclosed properties. Before, and we have- we, before we keep exploring all of these things, uh, because we're going to have to take a little break to show a video in, in a moment. And I just wanted to remind people we're talking about food, not bombs. And if you go online, you'll find their website. And if you find their website, you'll find ways to get involved. And we're going to be coming back in a little bit and talking about some of the ways you can be involved. And it isn't a charity, but you can donate. And they do, I believe, have a store where you can buy some of their merchandise uh, that also helps. So look for that. Meanwhile, we're going to have a little bit of a video from Food Not Bombs, and then we're going to be talking some more with our guest today, Keith McHenry.
Guys, it's not alright. You've already had I don't know if you're still using the show. Shut up, right? Don't be shame on you. Shame on you. Well, man, I'm serving food, so here you go. When your government takes care of the homeless, you don't need to be out here. Our taxpayers' money pay for kind gentlemen right here. Oh, I know. I know. I'm going to see a judge, and he's going to like be pissed off at you guys. So it's not just illegal to serve food; it's illegal. It's illegal to eat at the park. Illegal to eat at the park. Now yeah. I would just like to point that out. Yeah. People are the profit. Free will. All share food. No way. All share food. We are here to make them with us. All of you. Every When you all go home to your families and they ask you what you did today, you let them know you arrested people for sharing food with the less fortunate. These are the people who keep Tampa hungry. This is what your tax money pays for. To actually protect Tampa. Good job. Thank you for breaking unjust laws! Thank you for breaking unjust laws! Well, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that short video, folks. And uh, let's get back to how you as <clears throat> individuals and I as an individual can get involved in working with my guest today, <clears throat> Keith McHenry and this great organization called Food Not Bombs. Keith, what are some ways we as people can be involved and help in this cause? Well, the most important thing is to volunteer. So there's two basic ideas. You can go to foodnotbombs.net, and at the top, uh, there's a link called Volunteer. And on that, you get bit, roughly two choices. One, joining a local Food Not Bombs chapter and helping them prepare food, collect the food, cook the food, organize meetings, rallies, concerts, blockades, participate in whatever direct actions are going on. Or, if there isn't a group in your community, you can start one, and they have a seven steps to starting a Food Not Bombs link, and it tells you the seven steps, which are, are pretty straightforward, mainly uh, start out by making like a Facebook page and way to communicate and so on, and then choosing like, uh, you know, where you're going to collect, you know, there's an example of a uh, agenda and so on for your early meetings, and there's materials like flyers to get the word out mm -hmm. in your town. And so they're all self-directed uh, organizations, so you can plug into one existing or one uh, start your own. Then the other things that you can uh, do is if you're already involved in a uh, movement, say you're involved in, uh, you know, stopping uh, environmental destruction or uh, um, supporting immigrant rights or something like that, you can connect your group to Food Not Bombs. And there's two really key ways there. One of them is provide literature about your local actions or national campaigns or whatever to the local Food Not Bombs group to have at their uh, regular meals and at all the places that we're going out and, and tabling because we meet like massive amounts of people one-on-one -on -one because of our public presence. And the second is invite Food Not Bombs, local Food Not Bombs groups to provide food and logistical support for whatever actions you have. And so one of the amazing things that uh, I think in the Trump era is that some of our actions could be very ongoing and like Occupy or like, um, uh, Ray, you know, Reagan Ranch back in the 80s or, um, you know, so block, the huge blockades uh, uh, during the WTO protests in Seattle, so on. You need food to keep the movement going. 
So kitchen and food at your action can keep your occupation, blockade, uh, sit-in, or whatever it is happening, uh, you know, for almost indefinitely, really. And that provides your local group or your local effort or your local movement this kind of flexibility that they wouldn't otherwise have because we already have the equipment, we already have the food connections, we already know what we're doing, so you can just call on us to – you can now think outside the box. Oh, I want to block uh, – uh, there's a proposal I saw of people blockading the east-west railroad lines across North America. There's six key points where you can essentially shut down just-in-time manufacturing and coal trains and all that. Take about six to 800 people to do it. Um, uh, we've done similar things in, in, in uh, the past. And Funabans can provide meals at those blockades and uh, could have huge uh, in impact on saying we are against the – fossil fuel industry and we don't like the direction Trump is taking the world and so we're uh, you know we're interrupting capitalism for a month or something like that so food up bombs could participate in such an action by providing the food necessary to do a long-term sustained action now you're, you're talking about some pretty intense political action here and one thing you didn't mention in getting in preparing yourselves for doing this, folks, is one thing that Keith didn't mention, is there's a pretty good likelihood of coming into some conflict with the authorities. Yes, there is. Actually, both of my most recent books, The uh, Hungry for Peace and The Anarchist Cookbook, have very detailed uh, information on what to do to, one, avoid uh, as best as possible, being accused of terrorism. Um, many food not bombs activists, sadly, have been the target of the uh, FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force and so on. We, in fact, were declared America's most hardcore terrorist group by the uh, military in 1988. And so we've had a lot of problems with that. And so I have tips on how to avoid, really, that problem. But I also have the tips for, like, if you... You know, before you go out and get yourself arrested or do something that could potentially cause you to be arrested, like go to a regular, a peaceful rally is all you really need to do anymore. It's good to have um, develop affinity groups is what we used to call them and what I still call them, where you have a couple of people that know that your cat needs to be fed, that your boss needs to be called, that knows where the National Lawyers Guild contact number is and is able to uh, – to keep your life going on the outside while you're incarcerated. So I made a huge mistake in, uh, in um, before Occupy. I got arrested and held 18 days in, in uh, Orlando for feeding the hungry. And I that was the first time I had been detained in that manner since the cell phone was invented and since uh, all these other things were going on. And I had really made a huge mistake that I hadn't passed the cell phone on, which would have been the – there was 18 days where no one could get a hold of uh, Food Not Bombs uh, on the toll-free number, 1-800-884-1136. I didn't give any passwords to anybody so that they could keep up, you know, uploading stuff to my Facebook feed. None of that. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I, all my um, over 100 arrests were before I had all this technology at, at my hands. And so... I was completely unprepared for the disaster. So if you have actually support people on the outside that can communicate and you share your passwords to people, there's a way that they can get access to your phone if at all possible, and that your world can know what that you're incarcerated, that why you were jailed, um, they can uh, uh, people have an, uh, an idea of when you might get out. And that you already know that you have lawyers set up in advance, that your pets aren't going to, you know, you know, the worst thing to do is be in jail and then go, oh, my God, my dog can't get out and poop. Imagine how bad my apartment's going to be when I finally get out. And they've eaten the couch as a last resort because there's no dog poop. So you don't want that to happen. So I wrote an article uh, right after Trump was uh, – um, appointed president, and he and, and my um, suggestion was that we start to divide up into uh, or into affinity groups. And affinity group is like the cl people you trust, uh, you know, six to feed eight, your dog. <laughs> yeah, and then and yeah, and then you have some people you know are going to stay away from the action so they can support you, legal support. Mm -hmm. This is in my 
books also. And then you have, um, all, uh, and then at the same time, um, you work together for months and months. And this was, the, I believe, the downfall of Occupy. It was like thousands of people just showed up. And no logistics. Yeah, no logistics, no uh, little, you know, communities of people. So in Clamshell Alliance back in the 70s, which is a lot of where I get my um, political education from, was when we were trying to shut down Seabrook Nuclear Power Station. Right, up in New Hampshire. Groups. Mm -hmm. And then our, I would go uh, uh, every more, Monday through Friday, my affinity group showed up. It was called Silver Seed um, after the, well, I guess, Neil Young song or whatever. Or, well, I forget whose song it is. But uh, we would meet at the food co-op and we would uh, go running for like three miles as an affinity group. So we'd be really healthy when we went to right. the protest. We did fundraising for just our affinity group. We got to really know each other. We got to trust each other. And uh, and um, and that way then rumors couldn't spread and all yeah. the infiltration and the, all the surveillance state stuff would uh, have a lot less impact. And I think all activists today globally at this point, since we are facing an era of uh, what overt fascism, you know, not the yeah. friendly fascism we've seen in the past, that we... Uh, could organize it in this manner. So and, you, know, well, you have these, this information in your books, and people can buy the books by going to Food Not Bombs and going to the store, right? Right, yeah. correct. Just wanted to get that in, folks, because, you know, that's an important, because this is important information, and you really want to think about it. Now, you brought up something before, and I wanted to make sure I raised it back up. You, Food Not Bombs has been labeled a, quote, terrorist group. Do you think of yourself as a terrorist? Or are you a ter what is a terrorist in your mind? Okay, well, a terrorist would be somebody wanting to do violence against people or animals and, uh, and the earth. And, um, and we are not those people. But I can totally agree that from the point of view of corporate power and from the point of view of authoritarian governments, that uh, it makes sense that we would be considered terrorists. So this is something that I and, and uh, viewers, if you have the time to research this, it would be fantastic. But they, I watched twice on C-SPAN in uh, April of 2009 a lecture by some State Department official. And I believe it was at Fletcher School of Diplomacy in Medford, Massachusetts. Tufts University, yeah. Yeah, Tufts University, where they um, um, compared the people that share the vegan meals in the parks to Al-Qaeda, who's more dangerous. And if I had not watched this twice, I wouldn't have believed that, uh, that, that I actually saw it. And they said at the end, in closing, that the group that's sharing the vegan meals is actually more dangerous than Al-Qaeda because they are influencing the public to think that money should be diverted from military spending to education, health care, and other social services. And that they are very friendly. People enjoy eating their meals, and they're really bending the minds of the American people to think that the domestic needs were more important than preparing for war. Al-Qaeda, on the other hand, would, they said would not last. Uh, they said that the vegan meals would last another 30 years. At that, uh, you know, on May 24th, 9, uh, 2000, and, and um, whatever that was, 10 would have been uh, the 30th anniversary of Food Not Bombs. So even though they didn't say the name Food Not Bombs, what group is serving vegan meals in parks for right. 30 years at that point? But they say Al Qaeda, who wants to join a group like that where you put a bomb on yourself and die? Mm -hmm. That's very unpopular, and that probably won't last uh, another 20 years. And, of course, a lot of people uh, will point out that the roots of al-Qaeda uh, actually were watered by the United States with the funding of uh, but people like bin Laden and, uh, and to fight the Soviet but Union. But sadly, uh, that kind of terrorism has lasted in, over yeah. the 30 years, just as uh, Food Not Bombs has lasted over 30 years. But, you know, it's a very interesting point that from the point of view of the militarists and big corporations— in a very real sense, you are a greater danger because while you can get other people, you can send out a clarion call, we've paid the, 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 the evil, quote, Muslims, which of course is what Mr. Trump has said, the evil Muslims are, are coming, we've got to man the, the barricades, 
Let's build the walls. <laughs> That's one thing. But what are you going to say? Well, these terrible people who want to give you free food and talk to you about values are coming. Oh, my goodness. That's pretty scary to the corporate. Uh, and it's free food right away, right away, free. Yeah. That's a threat. Yeah. Abundance. No scarcity. They're the concept that's the threat. And doing it yourself, DIY, without needing the government to provide funding. They just public, the citizens go and to PayPal or to yeah. put a dollar in your bucket at the meal. And that it's all self-funded and, and, you know, 40% of the food that's grown is thrown away before it even gets to the yeah. table. There's abundance here. We don't need to be hoarding food so people yeah. are so hungry they've got to go to, uh, you know, buy a Big Mac or something. Yeah. You know, there's there plenty are, of great organic vegan food for people. There are, there are three things that can be given reasonably easily free. Food is one. Education and health care, much health care, and, and even to some degree housing could be, all of these things could be done relatively inexpensively uh, and provided so that uh, Americans here in this country, or, but or people in every country, could live decently. Uh, and you know what? If we could get rid of all the bombs and the, and the military and all of that and, and, and the obscene corporate profits and we got rid of all of that and put it into providing those kind of basic human needs, uh, we'd have plenty left over to plant flowers. <laughs> and, 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 you know, write poems. Trees. Um, we, you know, it's not, it's, I mean, I, I garden and, mm -hmm. and I have a, the Puna Bombs preschool every summer from May to October in, in Taos, New Mexico. Well, I know hard, how hard it is to grow food. That's not the easiest climate to grow food in. But um, but it just, it's, you know, you, I don't need many resources to plant all those seeds and save all those seeds every year and put them back in the ground again. And I took one ear of Hopi corn and I now can grow like well, uh, well, done hundreds of. Wow, welcome back. I kind of went over my stopping point there. Sorry, folks. But you, uh, we were just talking about um, that you actually can make a difference. And it's not all that difficult. And Keith McHenry from Food Not Bombs was telling us about growing his own food out there in Taos, New Mexico, which he mentioned was not an easy place to grow, but that you can't. Of course, the... the uh, People the, who have lived in Taos and the Pueblo there have been growing food <laughs> for millennia. <laughs> so I guess it's exactly. That's actually why I um, have the preschool in uh, Puna Bonds Preschool and the group of us that started it from Puna Bonds mm -hmm. because it, it is like uh, the birthplace of, of agriculture in North America. Mm -hmm. um, maybe also you could, you could say places down in Mexico as well. But in the United States, uh, that is definitely where farming started. And um, so we are trying to... I'm willing to bet that a few of my Native American friends will probably want to argue that, no, it was in this place or this place. But one of the interesting things you do point out there is that although in some ways the model of farming and, and uh, agriculture was different uh, yeah. through in in the Americas from what were on in Europe. It was a very advanced agricultural and, and, and uh, animal husbandry uh, culture. The difference was, of course, one of the big differences was that they didn't actually raise animals on farms, but rather controlled population of animals that were free flowing like in hunting. But, but they were very, very aware of what they were doing. And there's a lot of evidence to show we have a lot we could have learned had instead of, we practiced food, not bombs, or in that case, food, not smallpox and infected uh, blankets. Right. Yeah.
Exactly. So there's a, and, it, and we do, like a lot of our crops are actually seeds that we've inherited from the native community. Mm -hmm. so what our pumpkins, like our corn, like some of our squashes and beans and so on. And then we do a lot of cooperation with the local uh, Pueblo community. We um, have built, been building Ornos, uh, uh, Adobe ovens, and learning how to, you know, bake our food and bread in them and, and make Adobe bricks. And there's many, many things that we inherit from the local uh, Native American community. And one of the great things about Taos, which many people um, potentially are not aware of, is because the Rio Grande River goes by there. That's like the rivers, freshwater rivers, uh, are the, um, you know, the highways of the Mm -hmm. uh, ancient world, and and so people from way south in in uh, Central America often visited the Taos area, as people did come down from Canada. Not just so, the ancient world. I mean, you know, that's why New York City is where it is. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, yeah. So this is like a. Um, something that is, is important. And that's why, again, not having a pipeline under the Missouri River is important. Oh, yeah. That's why, um, so this whole, uh, to see the world as us living in balance and harmony is a big part of what Kuna Bond is trying to promote. Yeah. And with and, that, I think what we need to do at this point is thank Keith McHenry for joining us today. He's fascinating. I'm hoping that he will come back to walk on the wean side another time. And I know we have one more video that we're going to be sharing after I say goodbye. And folks, thank you so much for joining us today. Remember, we do this show because we are concerned about things that matter. And I can't think of anything more important in this world than how we approach living with one another in a positive, peaceful, and productive way in which we care and share. And if there's one organization that has typified those values in my lifetime, it is certainly Food Not Bombs. And thank you very much, Keith McHenry, for joining us today. Thank you, Keith. Thanks. Oh, um.